Hello everybody, this is Dr. Bricker here. We're going to be continuing with Chapter 7. Before we do that, I thought I'd give a little review of what we did um, previous time in class. So we're, we're in Chapter 7, which is the rotational motion chapter, and we started talking about uh, rotational motion. We've got a few new variables to consider. Um, in the old translational world that we had in the beginning of the semester, we had position, which was just called X or Y, depending on which direction you were going. Now in the rotational world, we have we have angular position, so um, it's measured in radians, so angular position. Okay, so then we're going to have angular displacement, just like we had linear displacement before. So this is what we talked about uh, last time when we met in class. We also have angular velocity, so omega is a symbol for that. Not W, omega. Something like this. Uh, measured in radians per second. So radians are the uh, SI unit that we're going to be working with. In the linear world, we had meters. In this rotational world, we have radians. We also have angular acceleration, so alpha is angular acceleration in radians per second squared. Okay, uh, here's the conversion factor between radians and degrees. So if you go around a circle one time, you've gone through uh, 2 pi radians. So 2 pi radians, 1 revolution, 360 degrees. Uh, there's one thing I had, didn't put here yet that I want to add. We also have a uh, relationship for omega. So if you go around one time, you've gone around 2 pi in a certain amount of time called the period. So that's another way of looking at omega. Go around one time, you've gone 2 pi, uh, divide that by the, by the period, that gives you the uh, angular velocity. Also, you could write it as 2 pi times the frequency because 1 over the period is the frequency. Okay, so I want to include that with the uh, top part there. Okay, and now we have a key to go from the rotational world to the linear world. We talked about this in class. V, translational velocity, is equal to omega times r. So if something's rotating about its own axis, different points have the same omega. They go through the same degrees per second. Now, if you're a point farther from the axis ro of rotation, you're going to have a greater linear speed. And we did some examples about that in class. So V is equal to omega times R. Now, just like in the uh, translational world that we're used to, we had kinematics equations. We have the same thing here in the rotational world. So we've got three kinematics equations. First one, omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha times T, just like the uh, counterpart in the linear world. The second one we have is omega final squared is equal to omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. And then finally, uh, delta theta omega initial t plus 1 half alpha times t squared. I don't remember these equations per se. I just know the linear uh, ones. And then I know in this rotational world, instead of x, I have theta. Instead of v, I have omega. And then instead of a, I have alpha. Okay, so I've just gone through and replaced x, v, and a with uh, theta, omega, and alpha. Okay, so um, one thing to, to remember, if you're rotating counterclockwise, so counterclockwise, that's the positive direction. Just like in the linear world, if you go to the right, that's going in the positive direction. Going in the left, towards the left, that's the negative direction. Okay, that's just the convention that we use here. Okay, so that's a little review of really the first two sections of chapter 7, 7-1 seven, through 7-2. So let's continue on with chapter 7, then we'll start with uh, section 7-3. Okay, so just like the linear world, we needed a net force to have an acceleration. In this rotational world, we're going to have, need a net torque to have an angular acceleration. So torque is related to force. It's just a little more complicated. It's the force, but where is it acting on the body? Some forces will produce a bigger torque than other places uh, on the body. Let's take a look at this. So here are some different views. Here's a hinge. So uh, forces with equal strength have different effects on a swinging door. So pretend you're trying to open the door here, where F4 is. You'll have a lot harder time at F4 opening a door then you will over here where F1 is being applied. F1 has a larger lever arm. F2, you have no hope of opening the door. You can't open a door by pushing on the edge of it. So think of torque as the ability to um, get something to rotate. In this case, it's the door rotating. 
Okay, so the greater the lever arm, so this by the lever arm I mean this, the distance to the force. So I just drew the lever arm for F1. The greater the lever arm, the bigger the torque's going to be. Now F3 also will get this thing to open. It's just you're not utilizing all of the perpendicular part of F3. So although this will rotate, the perpendicular part of F3 is not as great. Let me switch this to a pen and I'll show you, show you what I mean. So F3 here has a part in the X direction, this way, and a part in the Y direction. So it's this F3, and what I'm calling, I'll, be, I'll call it F3 perpendicular. It's perpendicular because it's perpendicular to the uh, lever arm. So this F3 perpendicular is smaller than F1. F1 is completely perpendicular to the lever arm. F3, the part that's perpendicular here, um, you know, it's smaller. This component is smaller than F1. Okay, so although F3 and F1 are the same force, the perpendicular part of F3 is smaller than F1. All of F1 is perpendicular. Okay, so the torque, it turns out to be R, and then the perpendicular part of the force. The units are newtons times meters. Okay, so tau is the unit of, uh, is the symbol for torque. We've got all these Greek symbols to, to get used to. Uh, part of the difficulty, I think, even with this rotational uh, subject and the circular motion subject, is just getting used to the variables. So make sure that you have a little note written down what they mean, even what they are. This is tau for torque. Okay, so the radial line is the line starting at the pivot point and extending through the point where the force is applied. So here's, uh, here's the axis of rotation here, right in the center. There's the force, so we're doing the distance over to the force. And then in this example, we want the perpendicular part of the force. This part. That's the part of the force that's actually perpendicular. So F perpendicular in this example turns out to be F sine of, of phi. Okay? So for whatever reason, maybe you have to have the force in the direction shown. Um, you're not maximizing the torque when you do that. To maximize the torque, you have to have the force perpendicular. But maybe this is you're trying to loosen a bolt. You can't fit your hand in there, so you have to have the force at some kind of angle. And then F perpendicular is the part of the force that actually is uh, getting this thing to rotate. Okay, so there's the a similar picture to why, what I had. Okay, good. So uh, the perpendicular part of the force in this example is F sine of phi. So if you look at R and F, phi is the angle between the direction of R and F. So the direction of R is here. The direction of F is here, as you can see. So that's what phi is. Okay. Another way of doing this is to figure out the moment arm. So in this, in this way of doing it, you extend the line of action of the force. So you, here's the force. You extend the line of action of the force this way, and then figure out the perpendicular distance to the pivot point. So the other way was looking at the total lever arm and the perpendicular part of the force. This way is looking at the total force, but the perpendicular distance to the pivot point. And it turns out you get the same answer. So um, the perpendicular distance to the pivot point here, our perpendicular, is R sine of phi, right? So we had phi up here before, um, same, same phi down here. So in this one we have uh, the torque being um, R perpendicular, which is R sine of phi times F. In the other one it was R times F sine of phi. So you get the same thing. So which one should you use, the previous method or this method? It just depends on the situation that you have. So some problems it'll be more natural to just get the perpendicular part of the force. Some other problems it'll be easier to figure out the uh, perpendicular part of the radius and use the total force. It just depends on the problem that you that you have. Okay. So uh, same thing though, you get the same answer. R, F, sine of phi. Okay, measured in Newton meters. So the bigger the R is, the bigger the torque you have. Uh, the bigger the force, the bigger the torque. The uh, closer this angle is to 90 degrees, the bigger uh, the torque. Okay, so several, three different ways of changing the torque, actually. Um, 
Here's an example we can take a look at. Ryan is trying to open a stuck door. He pushes at it a, uh, he pushes it at a point 0.75 meters from uh, from the hinges with a force of 240 newtons, directed 20 degrees away from being perpendicular. Okay, good. Now just be careful. They gave you an angle in the problem. That doesn't mean just go and plug it into the formula without knowing what it is. Uh, this is the dis uh, the direction of R. This is the direction of F. In the formula, if you just want to use the formula, phi is 70 degrees, so just be careful. Okay, uh, that's the first thing to get out of the way. Whenever you, you see an angle, make sure that it's the angle that you're looking for. There's a natural pivot point at the hinge. What torque does Ryan exert, and how could he exert more torque? Well, to exert more torque, Ryan could either make the uh, distance uh, from the pivot point to the force greater, he could make the force greater, or he could make the angle, uh, make the force be perpendicular to the uh, to the lever arm. Okay, so uh, if you want to figure out the perpendicular part of the force, though, it would be uh, F times the sine of phi, which is 70 degrees. You see down here, it's solved as the perpendicular part is F cosine of 20. It's the same thing. Cosine of 20 is the same thing as the sine of 70. But if you wanted to use the formula that you saw on the previous slides, phi actually is 70. Or if you just want to break the force into components and use the 20 degree angle, then you could use this one here, F cosine of phi. Okay? Excellent. So now we've got the perpendicular part of the force, 226. You, you know, again, you'd get the same thing up here, 226 newtons. And then multiply it by... 0.75 meters to get the answer. Okay, so I won't I won't put everything in. It's just uh, here's the formula, r, or sorry, f perpendicular times r. We have everything. Okay, good. So a torque uh, that tends to rotate an object counterclockwise. This is the positive direction counterclockwise, just like we had before. And then a torque that tends to rotate it clockwise is negative. Some torque some forces provide no torque. No torque, no torque. No part of that force is perpendicular to the lever arm. So the maximum torque would be, this one is totally perpendicular. This would be the uh, maximum negative torque because we're going in the negative direction. Okay, good. So sometimes there's more than one torque and you've got to add all the different torques together. So this just means add all the torques together. So all the torques that would make you go counterclockwise are positive all the torques that would make you go um, in the I think I said it backwards all the torques that make it rotate counterclockwise are positive all the torques that would make this rotate clockwise are negative just like all the forces that would make you go to the right you add together all the forces to the left you would subtract because they're in different directions okay good which third force on the wheel, okay, so here's a wheel over here on the left-hand side, which third force applied at point P will make the net torque be zero? Okay, so the force right here in the center at the pivot point doesn't make it rotate at all, so this doesn't even provide any torque. The only one that's providing a torque is the force right here where I just drew the arrow to, and that's going to make it rotate clockwise. And it's got a pretty large lever arm out here, right? That's the distance to the pivot point. So what force could we add over at P to make it ro to make it not rotate at all? Okay, so we've got this force down here, all the way on the edge. We want to add another force at point P so that it doesn't rotate at all. In other words, the net torque is zero. So the distance from the pivot point over to, whoops, over to point P here, it looks like it's about half as much or something as the distance from the pivot point over to the force at the bottom. So to make this not rotate, I'm going to have to add a larger force over here. So why is it larger? Well, this distance here, let me switch to a different color. This distance here is smaller than this distance here. So if this force here is, uh, if this distance is greater, this distance is smaller, this force is going to have to be bigger, and then the torques will balance out. So the net torque is zero. 
larger force, smaller distance, smaller force, larger distance. Okay, so the choice is uh, choice A there. Okay, and then again, the one at the pivot point provides no torque. So we will do these problems on uh, Wednesday when we meet in class. So make sure you take a look at, at homework eight. Homework eight, it's available. We've already done a few of those problems and it's uh, due a week from today. So today is uh, the, uh, whoops, today's the ninth. I believe it's due on the 16th. Okay, so you got a whole uh, whole week to do it. But, you know, start doing it, take a look at it, bring your questions to class on Wednesday. And we'll take a look at those Wednesday. So there's gravitational torque and center of gravity. So if you think about it, here's a, a gymnast. All the different parts of the gymnast, um, you know, of the, all the different pieces of mass, in other words, of the gymnast, are under the influence of the force of gravity. So um, there's a distance to each point, so there's going to be um, a torque on each point. Now there's a special place called the center of gravity where we could take, uh, we, we could assume that all of the force of gravity is on one point, and that's the, uh, the center of gravity. So here's a little example. So say you have uh, a uniform shape like this, and it's balancing on this little wedge. So, you know, all the points on the right hand side, um, there's a force of gravity in each of those points. There's all different pieces of mass on the left hand side. Each of those has force of gravity. So, you know, uh, the right hand side's trying to rotate clockwise, the left hand side's trying to rotate counterclockwise, but there's a special point here called the center of gravity, COG I'll just call it, where you could assume that all of the, all of the mass is located. So at that special point, if that's where all the mass is located, the force of gravity is right on that point, and there is no torque then, it's just balanced there. That's a nice uniform shape. I just drew a uniform shape so it's right in the center. But you could imagine if you had a hammer, let me try to draw a hammer, Okay, some other shape doesn't really look like a hammer. This part's supposed to be a lot, uh, maybe it's a hatchet. Good, I was chopping firewood today, so maybe that's what's on my mind. Um, there's a lot more mass towards the left-hand side than the right-hand side, but there is a point where you could actually balance this, and you use your imagination. The point is going to be closer to the, uh, the more massive side, and there's a center of gravity here. And that's the point where you could assume all of the mass is located. So you could literally balance a hammer on your finger if you wanted to, if you put it at the center of gravity. Then there's no net torque. There's definitely um, mass on the left hand side, so there's a force this way. There's mass on the right hand side, so there's a force that way and a torque that way. But the special point called the center of gravity is the point where you could assume all of the mass is located. And if you could balance it on a little wedge like this, this is that's where the center of gravity is. So gravitational torque can be calculated by assuming that the net force of gravity acts on a single point. And again, that single point is the center of gravity. And um, back to the picture of the gymnast here, that's where the center of gravity is. You could actually change your center of gravity. So say you uh, bend over to pick something up. So you, you, you know, imagine yourself doing this. You've dropped something on the ground. You reach over to pick it up. Now, if you just reach over and pick it up, you're probably going to fall over unless you like take one of your legs and push it back the other direction and you adjust your center of gravity by doing that. You do it without thinking. You don't think I need to change my center of gravity but from walking around and uh, picking things up, you know, that you have to do something like that, right, to keep the center of gravity over your support, your, your foot. Okay, so it's that special point where um, you could assume all the mass is located, center of gravity. Okay, so here's an example. A 3.2-kilogram uh, flagpole extends from a wall at an angle of 25 degrees, as you can see there. Its center of gravity is 1.6 meters from the point where the uh, pole is attached. Okay, so it's out there. What is the gravitational torque on the flagpole about the point of attachment? Okay, so here's some kind of flagpole. We know the mass of it's given. 
the, uh, the distance to the pivot point is actually given. And they're telling us where the center of gravity is here. And it looks like it's kind of skewed to the right of this because you got this other mass over here. But overall, the center of gravity is um, 1.6 meters. And we've got this angle of 25 degrees. And we want to figure out what the torque is. Well, technically, the torque is negative. Um, so you have to keep that in the con take that into consideration because this would rotate clockwise. Okay, so the torque, oh, let's just continue here. The torque, uh, negative because it's making it rotate clockwise, r perpendicular times w. So it's the, the perpendicular distance times the force. Remember, that's what torque is. So just in, in general, r perpendicular times f. It just so happens in this problem, the force is the weight. That's what's actually getting it to rotate. So that, if that's the center of gravity, we can assume the force of gravity is right at that point. Okay, so the perpendicular distance, you'll have to do a little bit of algebra for this. You want to figure out what this distance is, right? So um, it looks like cosine of theta would be r perpendicular over r. So then r perpendicular is uh, r times the cosine. 1.45 it turns out to be. Okay, and then it's the weight. Not the mass, the weight. It's a force. So negative, here's the perpendicular distance. And then the weight is this part, m times g. And you get negative 45 newton meters. Okay, so if you were holding this and you let it go, it would swing, right? There's a net torque. Okay, good. So an object that is free to rotate about a pivot point will come to rest when the center of gravity is below the pivot point. So right now, in this picture, there is a net torque. This is making it rotate um, clockwise, making it rotate this way. Now, if you get in the situation where it's just hanging straight down like this, weight the weight force is no longer making it rotate. There's no uh, angle between R and F. R is straight down. The weight is straight down. It, it'll just stay there. That's an equilibrium position. Okay. So... Um, Finding the center of gravity. So it doesn't mean it's literally in the center all of the time. I mean, if it's a uniform shape, then the center of gravity actually is right in the center. But it doesn't have to be in the center. Like the hammer example, when you balance a hammer on your finger, you're not balancing it in the middle of the object. You're balancing it towards the, uh, the head of the hammer. So there's really more mass to the left than to the right. But the right-hand side, the handle part, would have... Uh, uh, a bigger uh, length. So uh, we're looking at the point where the special point where you could balance it on your finger. That's the center of gravity. We can actually calculate it too. And it says down here big mass versus small mass and we'll take a look at that in just a second. Actually this is the example. So we've got a one meter uh, long dumbbell has a 10 kilogram mass on the left hand side here and a five kilogram mass on the right hand side here. And we want to figure out, uh, find the position of the center of gravity. So if you had to guess, where could you balance the set on your finger? You know, it would be closer to the 10 kilogram side. So you can see there's not an equal mass on each side. There's not equal mass on the left and right hand side. And actually this is the place, if you put a little wedge there, you would actually be able to balance this. Okay, so we can use the formula to figure out where the center of mass actually is. So... Um, go back to the previous slide. So here's the formula. It looks complicated, but the bottom really is just adding up the mass. So the bottom is just the total mass. Uh, now the top here, we're taking each mass and multiplying it by its location. Next mass multiplied by its location. Next mass multiplied by its location. You don't always have, you know, multiple masses like this. You have to have at least two. In this example, we have two. Okay, so let's, uh, let's use that formula. So we're just figuring out the x center of mass. Okay, I'll try to write it up here. x center of mass. Okay, so it's the first mass, 10 kilograms. It's where it's located, 0. Plus the next one, 5 kilograms, where it's located. Okay, so it's located at 1 meter and then divided by the total mass. We just have two masses in this example. 
So 10 plus 5 gives us 15. So 15 uh, kilograms. Okay, so we put the numbers together. This would give us, um, this turns out the first term is 0. The second term is 5 kilogram meters divided by 15 kilogram meters, so 0.33 meters. Okay, which that's our intuition tells us that, right? It's got to be closer to the larger mass. So the center of mass of the 10 kilogram, 5 kilogram dumbbell system is 0.33, closer to the uh, 10 kilogram. And again, that's where if you wanted to balance this on your finger, that's the point where you could actually do it. A couple more problems here that we will take a look at on Wednesday. So hopefully you have a chance to look at them, you know, before we come to class and um, so you have some more idea what's going on with that. Okay, so uh, torque cars causes angular acceleration. Uh, the tangential and, and angular accelerations um, are this. So we saw this at the end of section uh, 7.2 tangential acceleration. We just called it acceleration before, but to distinguish it between um, angular acceleration, we put a little t on it for tangential acceleration. We also have that the angular acceleration, uh, we could write like this. So where does that come from? Uh, tangential acceleration, alpha times r. So uh, if you take uh, this formula plug it in here for tangential acceleration and then move the r to the other side you get angular acceleration is f divided by m times r now i don't believe i included this actually in the little review so uh, you know add that to the to the uh, to that information i gave you this v is equal to omega times r i think i neglected to put uh, regular acceleration is alpha times r so maybe write that in next to that Okay, so the uh, tangential force causes the tangential acceleration. This is in the linear world. Um, really, we, we got three different accelerations now, right? There's also the acceleration towards the center. Uh, we did this in chapter 6. This is uh, called radial acceleration v squared over r. So if you get something that's actually speeding up, you could have several different accelerations. This one is uh, in the same direction that it's moving. This one is towards the center, and angular acceleration is just another way of looking at, at both of those. And again, here's the key to go from the translational world to the rotational world. Okay, so we'll have to put all this stuff together and keep track of it. Typically in this chapter, though, we don't really talk too much about centripetal acceleration. I'm just showing you that it's actually there. Okay, so alpha is uh, F divided by MR. We just saw this. Uh, torque is R times F. So we can put this stuff together. So remember alpha is F over MR. We just saw that. Um, F is torque divided by R. Torque divided by R. So you can take this for F and plug it back in here. And if you do that you come up with this equation. So uh, Alpha is torque divided by mR squared. Or another way of looking at it is torque is equal to mR squared times alpha. In a minute we'll see this mR squared has another value. So before, in the linear world, we had F is equal to mA. So you can kind of see the... Uh, analogous relationship between these. So in the linear world, F is equal to MA. That's perfectly good. That's Newton's second law. Uh, in this world, instead of uh, force, we have torque. It's force, but where is the force applied? We have, uh, instead of regular acceleration, we have angular acceleration. Now instead of mass, we have MR squared. In a minute, we'll see that this is called moment of inertia. Okay, so that force gets something to accelerate, depending on how much the mass is torque gets something to rotate depending on mr squared. Not only the mass, but how far is the mass from the uh, from the axis of rotation. Okay. So here's just a uh, you know random shape here with some uh, kind of random forces. F1 acting on M1, F2 acting on M2, etc. 
Uh, we can calculate the torque on each particle. In, in, in theory, you can do all that. It, it would be really hard to do for a shape like this. But for some uh, uniform shapes, we could actually do that. And we'll have a table of these different moments of inertia that we can take a look at. Okay, so more about that in just a minute. Okay, so going back to this example, torque 1 would be uh, mr1 squared and then times alpha. Torque 2 would be m2 r2 squared times alpha. Same thing for this one. We can add them all together. Remember that's what the net torque is, add all those together. Um, you get something that looks like this. The alpha part is the same though, right? The angular acceleration is going to be the same. So in theory add them all together. There, there could be more than three. Same thing here. Just putting in what the torque is. Alpha is the same for all of these. So you get alpha times adding up, add up all the mr squared. So the net torque is alpha. Right here, um, alpha. Add up all the mr squared. Okay. Now, in practice, you're not going to be adding up all these mr squared. There's certain shapes where we could we could do this using calculus. So add up all the mr squared. Uh, that's what. Um, moment of inertia actually is. Add up all the mr squareds. This is something called moment of inertia, and the symbol is I for that. Rotational inertia, moment of inertia, same thing. Now, if you're in engineering, you might have heard of moments. In physics, we call it torques. In engineering, you call it moments. It's different than moment of inertia. It's related to it, but by moment of inertia, I mean add up all the mr squareds. Okay. Good. So again, that's called the uh, um, uh, moment of inertia, rotational inertia. Units are kilogram meter squared. So what is that? Well, it's kind of like mass, but it's more than mass. It's related to mass. Mass is included. But how is the mass distributed? The more and more mass to, away from the rotational uh, axis, the bigger and bigger the moment of inertia is going to be. And I'll show you an example of that in class on Wednesday. Okay, so this is uh, Newton's second law for rotation. Torque is equal to I times alpha. And then it's up to us to actually put in all the torques. Just like we did before, F was equal to M times A. So it's not something completely new. We've, su we've seen Newton's second law in the linear world. Now we have Newton's second law in the rotational world. Okay, and we're ready to do some good things with this. So moment of inertia is the rotational equivalent of mass. Mass is in the formula, but how is the mass distributed? So if you're this person here in the first one and you get this, you try to get this merry-go-round to go, it's more difficult than this situation. Even though the masses are the same in uh, A here, more mass to the outside means it's harder to get this to, uh, to rotate. This one, relatively speaking, would be easier. Okay, so it's a measurement of how hard it is to get something to have an angular acceleration. Just like mass in the linear world, it's how uh, hard is it to get something to accelerate in the linear world. Okay? It's a synopsis of what I've just said. So here's a comparison of linear world versus rotational world. So before we had force, now we have torque. Before we had mass, now we have moment of inertia. We had uh, regular acceleration, now we have angular acceleration, and then again Newton's second laws. We had F is equal to MA, now we have torque is equal to I times alpha. All right, very good. So there are certain shapes where we know the moment of inertia. So um, some common ones are uh, this thin rod going through its center. Here's a thin rod rotating at its edge. So this one is harder to rotate than this one. Its moment of inertia is greater than this one. Let's look at these uh, hoops. This one's moment of inertia is mr squared. This is one half mr squared. So if you had the same shape, same mass, same um, size, this hoop, this one here, is twice as hard to rotate as this, even if their masses are the same. It's because in the second one, this one, there's more mass towards the outside. All the mass is towards the outside. Uh, same idea when you get the uh, solid sphere versus the uh, spherical shell. The spherical shell, 
it's hollow on the inside. More mass to the outside. I'm apparent, I'm assuming they've got the same mass and same radius. This one's got more mass to the outside, so it's harder to rotate. Okay, so this formula, this sheet, you don't have to write this on your formula sheet. I would give you these uh, these numbers. Okay, these, this formula actually. So it says, uh, try it yourself, hammering home inertia. Most of the mass of the hammer is in its head. So the hammer's moment of inertia is large when calculated about an axis passing through the uh, end of the, ha of the handle. So take a hammer, grab it on the handle, and move it around. Uh, then take the same hammer, gra grab it at the head, and get it and move it around. It's a lot easier if you grab it at the, the head where all the mass is and get it to rotate. You could move it around really easily compared to if you grab it at the, uh, on the actual handle and get it to rotate. You can definitely feel the difference. It's because the uh, moment of inertia is, is different. It's the same hammer, it's just easier to rotate. If you grab the head and rotate it, you could whip it around pretty quick. If you grab it on the handle, it's a lot more difficult. Okay, so uh, section 7.6, using Newton's second law for rotation. So uh, just like we did before, torque is equal to I alpha, and then we will have to actually uh, look and see what the actual torques are. What we did earlier in the chapter were torque, when we talked about RF sine of phi. I mean, this still works. You can still use this to figure out the torques. In the good old days, they would just tell you how much the force is, and you could use it. Here, they might tell you the force and the distance, the angle. You might have to calculate the torque, and then once you calculate the torque, then you could go back to Newton's second law. So the rotation rule just has one more step always. That's what makes it uh, a little more difficult. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, the engine in a small airplane is specified to have a torque of 500 Newton meters. Okay, so that's the torque. So what is torque? Remember, tau, 500 Newton meters. Um, the engine drives a two meter long, 40 kilogram single blade propeller. Okay, so the shape is important. So the overall length is two meters and it's rotating through the center. Okay. On startup, how long does it take the propeller to reach 2,000 RPMs? So there's always a point where we get to the hardest uh, problem of the semester. And uh, this one, I think, is just difficult because it's, it's completely new and there's going to be a lot to do in it. So we want to go from uh, startup. So we want to go initial angular velocity of zero up to whatever this means, 2,000 RPMs. Okay, good. So think back. RPMs. Okay, that's frequency but it's not in SI units. So we'll have to take a look at that. We can get it. We can get this uh, final angular velocity, though. I know it's 2 pi times the frequency. But the frequency has got to be in uh, revolutions per minute, not revolutions. I'm sorry. It's got to be in revolutions per second, not revolutions per minute. So essentially, we're going from here to here. How long does it take for that to happen? Okay, so um, to figure out how long it takes, we could use one of the rotational kinematics equations. So there's several layers. This is kind of like an onion problem. There's sev several layers. So we could use a kinematics equation. Omega final is omega initial plus alpha times t. We'll have to do a little bit of work to get omega final. Omega initial is zero. So if we had alpha, we could figure out the amount of time. We don't have alpha though, but we can get it because here's the torque. We could use Newton's second um, law for rotation. Torque is equal to I times alpha. So that means alpha is torque over I. Okay, so the torque is given. We have to figure out the I. So again, you're starting starting to see oh, this rotational world it's always more complicated sometimes they'll give you the moment of inertia in this problem they don't though they give you the mass and the shape but we can calculate um, the moment of inertia okay so uh, how can I calculate the moment of inertia let me go back a couple of slides this is uh, rotating through the center we could use uh, the formula here fin rod about the center to get an approximate answer so 1 12th ML squared. That's what we'll use here for, for that. I is 1 12th 
ml squared. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do, and I'll leave it to you to calculate it, the first thing we want to do is calculate the moment of inertia. Okay, there's the shape, the length of it's 2 meters, um, 40 grams, so 1 12th ml squared. You can do that. The second thing we want to do then is calculate the angular acceleration. And we can do that from Newton's second law for rotation. Torque given in the problem. Now you have I, you can get alpha. And then once you have alpha, you can do the little bit of algebra to this equation. I'll do it right here. Omega final, this term is zero, divided by alpha is equal to T. Okay? So that's the third thing you want to do to get the amount of time. Now just be careful. Uh, I guess an honorable mention is this to calculate omega final. 2 pi F. Now the 2000 is not the frequency that we need to use. We need to put it into SI units. So frequency 2000 revolutions per minute but we know that uh, one minute is 60 seconds. Okay, so 200 divided by 6. That's how you would get that number. Okay, so that's the frequency that you can use here to get omega final that you're going to use in the third step. Okay, lots of, uh, lots of stuff here. Uh, maybe take a minute, go back through the, through the problem and see what you can come up with. All this stuff is new, so it's going to take a little bit of time. Okay, good. Okay, so the final thing we'll look at uh, today, and then uh, on Wednesday we'll finish up the chapter, is uh, rolling motion. So rolling motion is a combination of rotating on its own axis and then also moving forward. Okay, so we're doing both of those. And we can look at a point on the rim here. That's what's being done here, point on the rim. So the point on the rim went from here to here. So every time it goes around one time, it goes this distance. 2 pi r. And this is rolling without slipping. So sometimes if you go bowling, if you remember as a kid, or maybe you still go bowling, you throw the bowling ball down the lane. Not only does it rotate, it kind of slides down the, the lane. So this is no this is with no sliding. This is rolling rolling without slipping means it's not sliding, it's purely just rotating as it's going. Okay, so that point went uh, a distance of 2 pi r, you know, uh, the circumference of a circle. So we know that v, the speed is going to be the distance, so 2 pi r divided by the amount of time it takes. And the, t the time to go around once is really the period, but they use t, so I'll just use t there. Okay, so we can take a look at how far the actual um, center of mass went in this example as well. Okay, so if it rolled without slipping, uh, the distance we have is 2 pi r, and uh, okay, here's where we have the, we're writing this in terms of the period, the, the amount of time to rotate once. So 2 pi r um, divided by the period. But remember, 2 pi divided by the period is omega. So I can rewrite this as omega times r. That's the velocity of the center of mass, right? That's how far the actual center of mass of this thing went. Okay, and, and that's what we have here. So this is the rolling constraint, rolling without slipping. Okay, we, we saw a similar uh, situation before, and it, it turns out that that's the same thing, omega times r. Now, um, rolling motion is pretty complicated. It's combined with translational. We can look at what happens to the center of gravity. Rotational. So if you, if you take those and mix them together, you're rotating on your own axis, while you're moving this direction without uh, without slipping again, we can look at some different points on, on this object. So uh, just the rotational part, the center isn't going anywhere. If you just think about it purely rotating, the, uh, the middle is going that way. <coughs> the top here is uh, moving with speed v just because of translating. Because of rotating, it's omega times r. So if you add those both together, you get um, twice as big. Now the point here at the bottom, um, just translationally wise, we have speed v. The, the point down here, in terms of rotation, is going this way. So for an instant, this is not moving at all. 
and that's what it's got to be doing right if it's if it's not slipping that point right in contact is not moving at all the center of gravity is moving with this speed and uh, the top is actually going twice as fast as the middle this is actually borne out in different pictures that you can see the top is blurry the bottom is not okay so this is ideally rolling without slipping and here's a picture of it so down here for an instant it's not moving the top is moving twice the uh, velocity of the center of grab uh, center of mass and this is the center is just moving at the velocity of center of mass and you can see that in the picture that doesn't look good uh, V center of mass okay so that's kind of neat I wanted to include that in our discussion here so the condition for rolling without slipping again is omega times r okay the diameter of your tires is 60 or sorry 0. 0.6 meters that's the diameter be careful you take a 60 mile trip at a speed of 45 miles per hour during the trip what was your tires angular speed okay now think back what does that mean omega how many times did it revolve well if we can figure out delta theta we could turn this into revolutions and solve that problem okay good so let's take a look at it diameter uh, 0 0.6 60 mile trip speed of 45 miles per hour so as you're doing this your tires keep rotating and rotating and rotating that's what we want to figure out here um, angular speed and also how many times did they rotate okay so we know from what we just did V is equal to Omega times R um, 45 miles per hour perfectly good but it's not in SI units here's the conversion factor 20 meters per second okay so if we know the speed and we know the size of the tire we can figure out the angular velocity that's what we want here from the first part right angular velocity so knowing the speed 45 miles per hour we can find that we just had to put the speed into uh, SI units to begin with so once we know the angular speed we can figure out uh, Delta theta from our rotational kinematics equations actually we can use this because we're assuming the entire time that Omega is not changing we're just going at a constant speed the whole time so uh, Delta theta Omega times T just like Delta X would be V times T in the linear world okay good so we have a good plan here so um, V over R so 20 divided by 0 0.3 67 radians per second so that's pretty good and again this is the radius not the diameter which is good um, 2 pi is when you go around one time so we're going through 67 radians per second so multiple revolutions per second which that makes sense to 45 miles per hour your car has to tires really have to go around okay so how long does this trip take well we can use the translational part to figure out how long it takes 1.33 hours um, turns out to be uh, we'll put this number together first here uh, 60 miles per hour divided by 45 60 miles divided by 45 miles per hour 1.33 hours and then we want it in seconds uh, 4800 seconds what we need this to figure out uh, how many revolutions we've gone through actually how many radians and then we can turn that into revolutions okay so uh, Delta theta is Omega times T we get 3.2 times 10 to the fifth radians perfectly good that's what Delta theta is but how many revolutions is that so take 3.2 times 10 to the fifth Delta theta uh, divided by 2 pi and you get 51,000 turns maybe another way of, of looking at it is, is this 3.2 times 10 to the fifth radians it's a 5 and then I know it's uh, one revolution or turn whatever you want to call it is 2 pi radians so we're just converting radians into revolutions the radians part and then you get 51,000 revolutions good so your tire revolves 51,000 times just on that not really short trip but not super long right so 51,000 times a lot you probably know from seeing tires on a passing car that they rotate several times per second at a speed of 45 miles per hour okay so uh, 51,000 doesn't seem 
unreasonable just because they're really turning a lot. It does seem like a lot because 51,000 is a lot, but, but it seems reasonable. A lot, but reasonable. During the lifetime of a tire, um, it'll rotate about 50 million times. So that's something. A lot of research goes into uh, you know, designing tires and keep them on the road for safety reasons, really. Okay, excellent. So again, we have to get used to all these uh, new variables that we have and really used to the new ones, but then they also relate to the old ones, too. Okay, so we'll pick this up, too, on Wednesday. Rotational kinetic energy and rotational angular momentum. So previously, we had separate sections on uh, energy, or several, uh, separate chapters on energy. This is just going to, is kind of folded right into this chapter. Same thing with angular momentum. So we have rotational kinetic energy. Again, we'll talk about this more on... Uh, uh, when we meet Wednesday, Wednesday. So you can almost guess this is going to be one half I omega squared. How do I know that? Well, in the linear world, we had one half mv squared. So I plays the role of m, whoops, and omega plays the role of v. Okay, I'll just put this in parentheses as a reminder. And now we have angular momentum, which is used for L. This is I times omega. And you could almost guess that because in the linear world, Regular momentum was m times v. So rotational world, we don't have m anymore. We have i. Uh, we don't have v anymore. I mean, it's still there, but we think about it in terms of the rotational uh, variables. So we have omega instead of v. Okay, so we'll talk about this also on Wednesday. Okay, so hopefully you have a chance to look at some of the homework eight questions. We'll go through a lot of those and then uh, talk about rotational kinetic energy and rotational uh, angular momentum. Okay. Talk, see you soon.